pray for my voice this morning. It keeps flopping in and out. Sometimes it's there and sometimes it's not. Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago. We're over in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and we're looking at verses 1 through 15. Our focus is verse 15, of course, but the context is fascinating as we consider it in light of the Christmas season. Of course, Christmas is a time for giving. Most of us will be spending time with our families over Christmas and having a wonderful time of giving gifts one to another. I hate the thought of exchanging gifts. We give gifts. We don't give so we can get something. We give because we love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So when we get together and give gifts, we're not exchanging gifts. We are giving gifts even if the other people couldn't afford to give us something. I hope you have that attitude as you give and don't think, well, let's see, my gift was worth so much and what they gave me wasn't worth very much. Uh, Kind of a cheap gift, but I gave them a really expensive gift. I hope that's not how you view Christmas. Because, as we'll see in our text today, the giving of gifts is a reflection of the way in which God gave his very best gift to us. Christmas is a time for giving. And of course, there are plenty of good reasons for this, but it's not because we're ending the year and looking for ways to get tax-deductible donations. However, Christmas did start during a bad tax time. God gave his gift to us during one of the greatest tax times in history, when Caesar was taxing all of the world. That decree went out into all the world that all the world should be taxed. But God didn't get a tax-deductible receipt. Instead, God gave his only begotten son to show us his love and to the sacrificial extent to which we should give as an example. God didn't just tell us to give. God set the example for us with the perfect gift of his son. The passage that we've just read here in 2 Corinthians 9, verses 1 through 15, deals with the way Christians ought to give to prove our love for Christ. Central to that passage is the marvelous closing verse, which is our text for today. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Unspeakable. In other words, there's no way we can adequately describe in human language the length, the breadth, the height of the gift that God gave unto us. The word translated unspeakable is anekdiegatos. It's a very tough Greek word, which means that which cannot be fully described. This is the only place in the New Testament where that particular word is found. There is no way to estimate the value of God's gift. There is no way to assess the full importance of God's gift. There's no way to put God's gift into a Christmas bag or a shoebox. There's no box big enough to hold the God of the universe himself, even though he came to us in the form of a babe. But did you hear what that verse said? If we're really in tune with what Christmas is all about, our first response should be thanksgiving. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Too often we think that we're through with thanksgiving when we eat the turkey and ham in November. But that's just a reflection of Christmas. The real heart of why we're thankful is the point of the incarnation. The point in history in which God broke through time and space to become one of us through the virgin birth. The creator God became sinless man at a specific instance in history that we call Christmas. I recently received, (coughs) during this past week, a string of seasonal emails from some of my high school classmates at the Stony Brook School for Boys. It was all boys back then, it's co-ed now, but back then it was us guys. But as I read them, I was kind of saddened. 
From the tone of the emails, you would hardly know that these men now had attended a Christian boys' school. Almost all of them sent holiday greetings or season greetings or some kind of warm, fuzzy feelings related to the cold season of the year. Only one of my former classmates made even a slight reference to God in relation to Christmas. That made me very sad. That's a Christian boys' school. So, of course, I responded with a cheerful Christmas greeting about the Incarnation and the great blessing that it is to have a Savior who died on the cross to redeem us from our sins. That's what most of them didn't want to hear, but they heard it. Never let the pagans in society bully you around into being silent on the great truth that Jesus is the reason for the season. You know, when you go to a boys' school, it really isn't cool to be too excited about God. However, on the other end, it really isn't cool to come to the end of life and end up in hell either. But let's talk about the unspeakable gift that God gave to us at Christmas time so long ago and why this should motivate us to sacrificially give to him as Paul has written in our text today. When we think of the unspeakable gift, yes, we think about Jesus himself, but did you realize that there's something addition to that? You say, what could be an additional to that? Well, <laughs> the unspeakable gift of God's Son brings with it the total access to all things that belong to the Son. Listen to how Paul puts it in Romans chapter 8, verses 31 and following. What shall we say then to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Now listen to verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? That's a pretty big package. <laughs> when you begin to understand what it means to be an unspeakable gift, how are you going to describe the all things that are ours in Christ when you're in him? You read Ephesians chapter 1. When you're in him, in Christ, in the beloved, in the Son, the all things belong to you. You have access to the all things. That's totally indescribable. And he goes on, Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died and rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Contemplate that for just a moment. I mean, just tell us a few of the things that are in that passage. Number one, the guaranteed sovereign protection of Almighty God is yours in Christ. Think about that. The guaranteed sovereign protection of Almighty God. Number two, the declaration that we are no longer standing guilty for our crimes because the penalty for sin has been paid. That's one of the things Paul lists there in Romans 8. Number three, the promise of the intercessory ministry of Christ on our behalf. He ever lives to make intercession for us. Number four, the promise that nothing can cancel the love that God has for us. There is nothing that can cancel the love that God has for you. If he gave you his son, will he not with him also freely give you all things? Number five, the guarantee that we are conquerors over every enemy and circumstance of life 
through Christ. That's powerful, folks. God's unspeakable gift. You could spend the rest of your life, in fact, we're going to be spending eternity seeing the marvels of God's unspeakable gift to us in Christ. Things that we are we, we already have access to and we don't even know we have access to. If you studied theology 20 hours out of every 24-hour day and only slept and ate for four hours, you could never plumb the depths of Scripture and see all the riches of glory that are yours in Christ Jesus. It is the unspeakable gift when God sent his Son to earth to be your Savior. That's truly an unspeakable, unfathomable gift beyond human comprehension. Second, the all things that are ours in Christ covers every need that we will ever have. Not our greed, but it covers every need that we will ever have. That's a pretty big gift. A gift that takes you all the way from the moment of conception all the way to the moment of death and goes with you all the way into eternity. Think of all the possible needs that you have had or can have yet ahead and all of those needs are covered by God in Christ Jesus for you. Not one thing is missing. That is an unspeakable gift. You can't even remember all the things that God has done for you throughout your life. The very fact that you're alive today and sitting here listening to the proclamation of God's word is part of the unspeakable gift of God to you. The fact that you own a Bible in your own language. In fact, probably every one of you has multiple copies of the Bible in your homes and in your vehicles. I hope you carry one in your vehicle. Always have it with you. Anytime you want, you can go to a bookstore and buy one. You can buy a Bible down at Dollar Tree. Amazing. It'll be a Bible printed in a communist country where they will persecute you for owning a Bible. But they're willing to make a buck off of you as an American. Hard to believe they can actually print an entire Bible, package it up, ship it overseas, transport it to dollar stores all over the country, sell it to you for a dollar, and still make a profit on it. We have an incredible number of blessings that God has poured out upon us in his unspeakable gift. Third, the unspeakable gift motivates us to share with other believers. Did you hear that when we read through 2 Corinthians 9? It motivates us to share with other believers. That's what that gift does. Listen to verses 1 and 2. For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you, for I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. If you really understand the gift that God gave to you, it's a point of motivation. It motivates us to give to the needs of others. Fourth, the unspeakable gift, still here in 2 Corinthians 9, the unspeakable gift gives us a future promise. Verse 6, But this I say, He which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Bountifully. Jesus, who is the author and the captain of our salvation, rejoices. He sowed bountifully, and it says he's going to bring many sons to glory. He gave an incredible gift. Can you believe that there are people out there in the world around you who walk away from that gift. From all the things that we've just been discussing, the meaning of every need, the guarantee of eternity. I mean, they walk away from it, they don't even try to unwrap it. Most incredible gift in the world, and they'll go and they think it's a great deal when some family member 
gives them a really big gift, like gives them a brand new Maserati or something, and they would rather have that than have Jesus. The unspeakable gift gives to us a future promise. Fifth, the unspeakable gift provides us with the right motivation for giving. Ah, oh, that's so important because when you give it the wrong motivation, it does you no good. It gives you the right motivation. Listen to what it says. Verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you, the E always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. God gave a gift of grace that is reflected as we give by grace, not by law, give by grace, not with the motivation of wanting to get something out of it, but it motivates us to abound to every good work because we always have all sufficiency in all things. Do you get all the alls? <laughs> God doesn't cut us short. Sixth, imitating the unspeakable gift causes others to give thanks to God. Look at verses 11 and 12. For the administration of this service, that is your giving, not only supplieth the want of the saints, but is abundant also by many thanksgivings unto God. While by the experiment of this ministration, that is your service to them by giving, they glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel. They say, wow, those people believe what they preach. They believe the gospel of grace. The way in which they give proves that they believe the gospel of grace. Did you get that? The way in which they give proves that they believe the gospel of grace. That God will, in fact, meet their needs. They don't have to be stingy about it. They can be generous in their giving because they truly believe that there's a God in heaven who owns all things and who will meet every one of their needs. They glorify God for your professed subjection unto the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. Now, you know, we're only scratching the surface here in, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. If you want an even broader, more full portrayal of all that you have in Christ, just glance over Ephesians chapter 1. I, I referenced it a moment ago, but let me just read you a few verses. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, is that a pretty big gift? <laughs> He's blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. When God gave you the Lord Jesus Christ as his gift to you, that's his unspeakable gift. The reason it's so unspeakable is both who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and what are the riches of glory in Christ Jesus that are now yours. That's a pretty big Christmas present. God wasn't stingy about it. He didn't hold anything back. Listen. Who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. That is a pretty big gift, folks. God chose you. That's a pretty big gift. You didn't earn it. You didn't work for it. You didn't buy it. God chose you. That is a very big gift. Otherwise, you would be outside. Otherwise, you would be lost. Otherwise, you'd be headed for hell. He's chosen us in him, that is in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Here is another incredible gift. Because he had a purpose in giving that, that we should be holy and without blame before him. I don't know about you, but sin in my life bothers me terribly. I mean, God has given me a sensitive conscience, and when I sin, I know it. But I know that God is conforming me to the image of Christ, and that gives me great joy. That we should be blameless, holy and without blameless before him. Listen to the next part. In love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children. That's what you know from John 3.16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Do you understand how predestination is part of that gift of all things that we have in Christ Jesus? It's a gift. It's not a work. Not something you did. Not something that you could do. The unspeakable gift that God has given us to the praise of the glory of his grace when he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Part of that gift is you are now accepted by Father, by God the Father. Why should you, answer it, why should you be accepted? If you went to the White House today and knocked on the door, if you could even get that far before the Secret Service got you, why would you be accepted in the White House? You have no reason. But you have been accepted because Jesus has chosen you has opened the door, for he himself is the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. pasture. Why should you receive that gift? The praise of the glory of his grace. You see, that's what grace is all about. He receives praise because he's exercised grace. Grace is extended to those who are guilty, who do not deserve anything. Mercy is extended to us as we are miserable, but grace as we are guilty, we deserve nothing. Here's part else of it. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Redemption and forgiveness and riches. Those are pretty big gifts, aren't they? wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Wisdom and prudence. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore get wisdom. And with all that getting, get understanding. That's what the book of Proverbs tells us. And he's given it to us in Christ. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will. The very fact that he's revealed himself to us according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him in whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Wish we could talk about the inheritance. Did you know that the gift of God's Son comes with an inheritance? Every time one of us shuffles off this mortal coil, as Shakespeare put it, we leave something behind, and somebody gets it. And if we hadn't written a will, the state will get a good chunk of it, and they will determine who gets the rest of it. An inheritance. Because God gave the gift of his son, God has also given us an inheritance of riches in glory in Christ Jesus, which are undescribable. I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them. This is an unspeakable gift that we have in Christ. The magnificence of the inheritance being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. In whom? That is in Christ. You also trusted after that you heard the word of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. That's part of the gift. If you don't have Jesus, you don't have the indwelling Holy Spirit. You don't have the earnest of the Spirit. You don't have the sealing of the Spirit. You don't have the indwelling of the Spirit. You don't have the empowering of the Spirit. That's part of God's gift to you. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. You have the guarantee that the one who gave you the earnest is coming back for you. The return of Christ. Okay, now try to put all of that into a Christmas gift bag. Truly God gave us an unspeakable gift when he gave us the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's look briefly at the nature and the character of God's gift. The Gospel of John presents Christ as the creator God of glory come in the flesh. And we'll be 
looking at that magnificent presentation and revelation of Christ tonight at the evening service, the Lord willing. But the other side of the coin is the sinless humanity of Christ, perhaps the most fully portrayed for us in the Gospel of Luke. The first four verses of Luke give us a wonderful insight into how the humanity of Christ relates to the gift that God has given to us. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, that means all the way from the birth of Jesus, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. Now these first four verses set the tone not only for the famous Christmas narrative by Luke in chapter 2, but they set the tone and the standard for the entire gospel of Luke, which portrays Christ in his sinless humanity. What do we learn from these verses? Well, first of all, this gospel is the historical standard by which all the other records are tested. Many have taken in hand to write a narrative of the early church, Luke says, but Luke covers it all from the birth of Jesus through the early church in the book of Acts. Two, none of the other gospel writers cover as much as Luke does. Three, the other gospel writers have different purposes in writing. Four, even the synoptic gospels, there are two others, do not cover everything that's contained in the gospel of Luke. Five, none of the other writers give the history of the early church contained in Acts, showing God's gift at work in the life of believers. Six, from these verses we learn that there are key essentials that make up the core of the Christian faith, not more, not less, that are the standard for what Christians believe, a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, is what Luke writes there in those opening verses. And number seven, and so important, especially as we consider God's gift. We're not talking about mythology. This is ordered time, space, chronological history. Verse 1, set forth in order a declaration, Luke says. And verse 3, it seemed good to me to write unto thee in order. Chronology is the key to meaning in the serious study of historical records. The second thing we learn about this as Luke is dealing with the person of Christ in his earthly walk on earth, God's gift to man. So what do we see in the character of this, this one who is God's gift to us? Luke went to the primary sources, not secondary sources. He didn't go to uh, commentaries. He didn't go campfire tales year after the events. He went to the living witnesses who are mentioned in the narratives. Quote, they delivered them unto us. That's verse 2. And Quote, from the beginning were eyewitnesses. That's in verse 2. That means when Luke records an event, he talked to the people who actually participated in the events. That means whenever you read about an event that mentions certain people, Luke talked to at least one and probably more of the people who were at that event. Luke was much like a modern-day investigative reporter. He did not simply read the Drudge Report or listen to national public radio. He personally talked face-to-face -face with the people who were at the scene of the events. And finally, Luke gives specific times and date markers in his gospel. For example, <clears throat> in Luke chapter 3, verse 1, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip, tetrarch of Vituria, and region of Trachionitis, and Licinius, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of God came unto John, the Zach son of Zacharias, in the wilderness, and he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. In case you don't know who he's talking about, he gives you multiple cross-reference points in secular history so that you can pinpoint exactly where this is happening, who it was happening to, what time it was happening at, and why it is important. God didn't just sort of sloppy, you know, drop a gift in a gift bag and throw it down to earth and hope it hits somewhere. You know, the way in which we give gifts, the way in which we wrap gifts, the way in which we surround the gifts with, if you want to call it an ambiance, tells something about the giver. God had an angelic choir announce the birth of the Messiah in his hometown 
in a setting that nobody would have guessed. <laughs> Unless they read the Bible. Unless they read the Old Testament prophecies. God told them years in advance that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem in the town of David. They told him who he would be. And to us a son is given. A child is born, a son is given. The government shall be upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And everybody was expecting, oh, line of David must be he's going to be born in a palace. But wait, when David started out, he was a shepherd. He was keeping sheep on the side of a hill. And shepherds were abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And suddenly the angel of the Lord appeared unto them and told them, Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. God did a miracle when he gave his gift. And as it was prophesied, he wrapped his gift in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. Because just like with my friends who sent all these emails, there was no room for him in the inn. He came into the world. And they didn't receive him. He came unto his own and they received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's why God's choice is so important and why his gift is so big when you unwrap it and see what it contains. When Luke writes of the preaching of John the Baptist and records John's words, he talks to someone who heard John preach, who took notes perhaps because Luke includes certain things that John said that no other gospel writer includes. That's verses 7 through 17. When Luke writes of Jesus preaching in Nazareth and the violent response of the congregation that tried to throw him off the hill, he talked to someone who was there and saw it happen. When Luke writes about the demon-possessed man in the synagogue whom Jesus healed, Luke talked to someone who was there, possibly even the man who was delivered from the demons. You've got to understand, these are all things in the Gospel of Luke. How did Luke find out about this? Because he tells us at the very beginning, twice he tells us, that he talked with the eyewitnesses. Luke talked to Peter's mother-in-law, someone who was there in the house when Jesus healed her, and she got up and fixed lunch. No other gospel writers mentioned Peter's mother-in-law. Luke probably spoke directly to the leper whose case was so bad that he had no hope, but he told Luke that Jesus actually touched him and he was healed. Luke was a physician, and so he has the greatest detail of all the gospel writers in describing the physical healings that Jesus performed. Like a doctor who carefully gathers case histories from his patients and writes them down to follow their treatments, determine their prognosis, describe medicine accurately. He was apparently an excellent doctor, well loved by his patients, because Paul writes in Colossians 4.4, 4, Luke, the beloved physician, and Demas, greet thee. Luke takes special note of those times that Jesus spoke of physicians. And he said unto them, You will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, here do thou also. Luke 4.23. Or how about 5.31? They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are six. Or about Luke chapter 8, verse 43. And a woman having an issue of blood twelve years, which she has spent all her living upon physicians, neither could be healed by any. And Luke is a doctor. And he's the one that records those things for us. We learn a great deal about the humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ when we look at Luke. The gift that God gave to us is both God and man. Oftentimes, once we get past the baby in the manger, we tend to focus on the deity of Christ, which is absolutely essential. If Christ isn't God, he can't save you. But sometimes we fail to look at this unspeakable gift in all of his pure, sinless, humanity, what he did. But the most exciting thing of all was that he spoke directly to those who were involved in the birth of Jesus. I think it's without question that he spoke directly to Mary. Luke, as a physician, would have wanted to record the exact details from Mary herself because this was a unique conception and birth in all the history of the world. 
Luke is the only gospel writer who records the Annunciation by Gabriel to Mary and the exact words of the angel. Luke is the only gospel writer who records Mary's response, her question, her faith, and what has been called the Magnificat. Luke is the only gospel writer who records Mary's excited trip to visit her cousin Elizabeth, who was already six months pregnant with John the Baptist. Luke is the only gospel writer who includes Elizabeth's words to Mary, heard only by those two women and the children in their rooms. Where else was he going to get those words? He got it from the eyewitnesses. Luke is the only gospel writer to include the exact historical time frame of Jesus' birth. And we've just read that in Luke chapter 2, verses 1 and following. And it came to pass that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. Luke is the only gospel writer to note the crowd of conditions in Bethlehem in the stable where Jesus was born in fulfillment of Micah 4, 8. Only Joseph and Mary would have known the travel details and the stable details recorded by Luke. Only Luke records the shepherds who came, shepherds who later told others what they had heard and seen. And Luke was one of those who interviewed the shepherds because he wrote down the exact words that the angels said and sang from heaven to the shepherds. Only Luke records the specific sign of swaddling clothes with which the baby Jesus was wrapped. Only Luke, the physician, records the circumcision of Jesus, a surgical operation, on the specific day required by the law. All the more surprising since Luke was a Gentile to whom circumcision was not a requirement. In fact, Luke records 50% more new content than all of the other Gospels, content that he gained by talking to the eyewitnesses as he tells us in the first four verses of his Gospel. Now, I hope you understand why that's important and why we have an eyewitness or multiple eyewitnesses of the Christmas account. Multiple eyewitnesses were absolutely required to establish the truth of the most serious matters, matters of life and death. And the virgin birth of Christ is a matter of life and death for you. If he was not virgin born, he is not the son of God. He is merely the illegitimate son of Mary and some fornicator or adulterer. If that is the case, he cannot save anyone from eternal hell. Eyewitnesses are required in matters of life and death. Deuteronomy 17, at the mouth of two witnesses or three witnesses, shall he that is worthy of death be put to death, but at the mouth of one witness he shall not be put to death. Chapter 19, verse 15, one witness shall not rise up against any man for any iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that he sinneth at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. How about Hebrews chapter 10, verse 28? He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Jesus and Paul restated that principle of this most serious matters in the church. Matthew 18, 16, Jesus speaking. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Paul talks about it. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 1. This is the third time I'm coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Shall every word be established? 1 Timothy 5, 19. Against an elder received not an accusation, but before two or three witnesses. That's why we have all of this about the humanity of Christ. So many witnesses of the exact specific words, the exact specific events. And Luke collects the witnesses. And so for the supernatural conception and birth of our Lord Jesus Christ, God has given us not just two or three witnesses, but myriads of witnesses. Zacharias and Elizabeth, the angel Gabriel, Mary and Joseph, the host of heaven, uncountable numbers, all of whom bore undeniably authentic, truthful witnesses. Multiple shepherds, family and friends who followed the pregnancy and birth of the new baby. Perhaps even the unnamed tax collectors who added the name of the new baby boy to the rolls. And this does not even count the additional witnesses mentioned in Matthew, such as the wise men, since Luke would not have been able to interview them personally as eyewitnesses. They'd already returned to their own country by another way to avoid Herod. God set the requirements for multiple witnesses to establish the truth. God himself follows his own rules. And God provided the multiple eyewitnesses so that we could know with surety that the things we believe about the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, as our Redeemer, as our God, as our King, 
as our substitutionary sacrifice that these things are true. Remember what Luke said? For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. Eyewitnesses. That's what's required in a court of law. We can know the certainty of those things wherein we are instructed. And because it is certain concerning his birth, it is certain for my witnesses concerning his death for our sins. It is certain about his resurrection because we have eyewitnesses. Our salvation is certain and secure because it is based on eyewitness testimony. The gospel of salvation, just like the conception and birth narrative of Christ, is an eyewitness account. Paul talks about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and he talks about that central. If you don't have the resurrection, you don't have salvation, first four verses. And then he goes into verse 5 and talks about the witnesses. And that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve, seen of about 500 brethren at once. Then verse 7, he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Verse 8, and last of all, he was seen of me. Eyewitnesses. There are eyewitnesses at the birth of Christ. There are eyewitnesses at the death of Christ. There are eyewitnesses at the resurrection of Christ. And these people, as eyewitnesses, were willing to give their lives because they knew it was true. What an unspeakable gift God gave to us. A gift that we don't have to wonder whether it's made out of plastic and whether or not it works. You know, you get something that looks really beautiful and it, you, know, you think, wow, this looks like a Ming vase. You look on the bottom and it says, you know, made in North Korea. <laughs> it's not a Ming vase. <laughs> Or made in California. It's not a Ming vase. If it has a sticker that's even made in China, it's probably not a Ming vase because they didn't put stickers on them back then. You have the authentic article. You can track it all the way back to where it was excavated, and you have historical records who made it during the Ming dynasty. We have even better proof concerning the birth, death, and resurrection of Christ. What an unspeakable gift God has given to us. But just like the record of Jesus' birth, and I need to emphasize this, we have overwhelming eyewitness testimony concerning his death and resurrection. And the question then becomes, have you believed? the eyewitness account. Have you trusted in Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ of Scripture, who alone can save you? God's unspeakable gift of Christ is only as good to you as whether or not you have trusted in Him. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your unspeakable gift, the Lord Jesus Christ. How we thank you for all the things that that brings with it. We have an inheritance in him, which eye has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. The incredible fact that coming with that gift is the intercessory ministry of Christ before the Heavenly Father. Coming with that gift is the indwelling Holy Spirit who day by day encourages, empowers, and directs us and gives us understanding of the Word of God. Coming with that gift of the all things that are ours in Christ Jesus. We understand why it's called an unspeakable gift because we could not for the rest of our lives that we gave every second to it list all of the things that are ours in Christ. And Father, as we understand that, it motivates us to thanksgiving. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. We thank you in the name of your unspeakable gift, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.